so we get uh, keep uh, cognizant of everybody's schedule. Uh, hi, I'm Mitch Gross. I'm there for the time at Oroville, and, and Marilyn Dell is on a cruise right now, so he is, he's in a better spot than we are. But I think we'll start with introductions, and we'll start with Rod, we'll just go around, um, and then we'll, Charlie, we'll start with you when we get to the audience point, when if you share, just give it a who's uh, in attendance. Rod Sullivan, Board of Supervisors. Tim Kemp, Mayor of Hills. Terry Donahue, Mayor of North Liberty. Jill Dodds, uh, City of Fordville. Susan Mim, City of Iowa City. Kurt Fries with the Supervisors. Colin Taylor, City of Iowa City. John Thomas, City of Iowa City. Lori Rutland, Iowa City School Board. Lisa Green Douglas, Board of Supervisors. Sean Iston, Iowa City School Board. Janet Godwin, Iowa City School Board. Lori Goodrich, Corva. Oh, Mike Carberry, Board of Supervisors. Rocky Cole, Iowa City. Steve Stan, Mayor Soul. Charlie Stan, Community. Oh, well. Ellen Hobble, City of Toronto. Mayor of the Gazette. Janet Swiner, candidate for State Senate. Zach Walls, also candidate for Iowa State Senate. Albert Cardinal Jedi. And Smith also the day that you can pick out KCRG. William Logan Dark. Ryan Sump of the Iowa City Area Community. Roy Stoltz. Doug Bolt, City Administrator Kepler. Jeff Ruin, City of Iowa City. Brian Iyer, City of North Liberty. Troy Hill, City of Coralville. Sherry Brown, City of Coralville. All right, we've got Thor, City Clerk, we're going to go back in the cheap seats back there as well. Uh, we'll get started here. First item uh, is an update on the crisis intervention team training the facilities, and this was brought to us by both the City of Iowa City and Johnson County. So I'm not sure who of those two entities would like to speak on. Well, I'll, I'll start and then we'll let Iowa City jump in. Uh, for those of you who who are new to the idea of CIT, it stands for Crisis Intervention Team, and it is a way to approach and um, deal with folks who are having a mental health crisis. And um, law enforcement in various places across the country are using this approach now uh, in order to deal better and more, uh, more mainly more people who have this situation and it is a way to de-escalate the situation and and then um, in some places they have a place to take these people instead of the jail or the ER. Um, jails and prisons in our country are the number one houser of those with mental illness so uh, we need to do better. We need to provide a, a place where they can get services and um, connections with other resources. So uh, we are at the point in our project where um, we are looking at a facility. We have um, a property under consideration. And that property, there were some concerns uh, about structural integrity. It checked out okay. Um, the, the concerns were just how the floor has a give and movement that it's supposed to have is built in, and it can actually withhold things. But recommendations came back about um, how not to use it, perhaps just because of that comfort level that people might have with it. Um, we are moving forward at this point with um, looking at this facility and core purchase. And the county has budget, budgeted uh, money both for the building itself and for operations after the facility is up and running. Um, and we've made an ask, and by we, that's just kind of a vague we, I'm not just talking about the county, but uh, the different folks who are involved with this project. Uh, we've made an ask to the different cities involved uh, for a portion of the capital uh, needs for that. For operations, uh, any shortfall up to $400,000, the county will take that on. Uh, at this point, we are close to finishing our budget and, and we'll be uh, setting up a date for our, our public hearing on our budget. Uh, it would be really helpful for us if we could get an idea from the different cities at what point, you know, what uh, contribution you are looking at for the capital portion of the project. So uh, if you have that information today, that would be really great to find out. 
And if not, we hope to hear from you soon. Uh, I don't have any more than that unless you have some specific questions. But otherwise, I will see. Can I jump in? Yeah, I would just say, you know, a lot of people have been working on this for a long time from the county to representatives of the municipality to a lot of the nonprofits. The university has gotten involved in the last year or so. And I would say that we are uh, very, very close to finally bringing this to fruition. Um, as Lisa mentioned, right now the only place that our law enforcement people have to take somebody um, if they feel they are unstable and are you know, unsafe for themselves or the community is either to the jail or to the emergency room. And it's not unusual to have law enforcement officers in there for hours at a time with people. So the Access Center um, is a model that's being used more and more around the country. A lot of us from this area have gone down and visited the one in San Antonio. That's where our law enforcement was going first for the training. Starting in 2018, um, we've done three training sessions in Iowa City uh, for local law enforcement as well as some from across the state because we do have grant money for it. So we have to open it up to more than just law enforcement within the county. Um, from Iowa City's perspective, we have budgeted the acts. Uh, we haven't finished our budget, but it's in there uh, for the capital costs. I think a, a huge breakthrough in the project, two different breakthroughs. One. Um, was when the county came forward and said, because one of the big discussions at all the strategic or at all the uh, uh, steering committee meetings was the shortfall, the operational budget, and with Medicaid and all the other things in terms of health insurance being so uncertain, how is this going to be covered? And when the county said that they would use basically what's already in their budget for these kinds of things and up to 400000 that all of a sudden took away a lot of the angst from a lot of people that are involved. So basically where we are now is along with um, the county working on the physical facility, we have people who are working on, um, and any of you on the, on the city councils have probably seen the white paper that came from the county, uh, they're working on the 28E agreements or other contracts uh, between the potentially some entity within the university who would be the management of it and the local nonprofits who would provide a lot of the services um, between the municipalities and the county, et cetera, to get all the, the legal pieces um, put together. So I think we're, we're getting much closer than we've uh, been a long time. I like to say that we've had some major breakthroughs and certainly hope that the other entities can find it uh, within their budgets whether it's over one year, five years, whatever, to contribute to the capital cost so we can get this thing going. It's it's really important for people in our community. I just wanted to add, John, let me out a few pieces that I mentioned. The trainings that we've held here, we have trained over 190 local law enforcement officers and others who deal um, with frontline uh, interaction with folks in the mental health crisis. So that's a huge number, and uh, because of that, now we are also seeing more and more uh, uh, interaction with our mobile crisis outreach team because they have the training to do follow-up services with people in crisis, uh, but we still don't have a physical place. So uh, that was an important thing to mention. Mobile crisis outreach will more than likely be housed there as well, and uh, we see that as an individual, at least um, giving them a place to be, if not, you know, perhaps help with provision of services. Yeah, and one of the things Lisa mentioned that it, she and I have been pretty intricately involved in this, and if you haven't been, one of the things that's really important about this is not just the physical facility, it's the providers that will be there and their ability to help these individuals connect to other services within the community. So it's right now oftentimes with the emergency rooms, people go in, they're seen, maybe they're admitted and put into a psychiatric bed, more likely not because they can't, they don't have them, they don't have enough of them. Um, so they sit there waiting, but then they walk out the door and they might be back two or three days later. The idea with a facility like this is a very holistic approach to working with people to help them stay out of jail, out of the emergency rooms, and connect them with the providers and the services 
within the community that help can help them stabilize their lives. And in lieu of a contribution to the capital campaign from the university, they'll be providing the, the actual medical care in the facility, is that correct? They are not providing any capital costs. There will be a contract in place in terms of uh, what they will be providing in terms of the management stuff. But a lot of our local nonprofits will also be providing a lot. To the right, so the university is providing actual medical care, correct? Or am I wrong on that? Yeah. I would say that's yeah, still up in the air in, in terms of how much, quote, medical care. Uh, I mean, there's crisis stabilization. There's there's a number of different levels from the detox and everything. Um, but there will be contracts between, assuming that the university does, in fact, manage between what they are going to provide in addition to management and what any of the other local nonprofits will be providing for services. So when you say assuming they're going to manage, is that not a decision? I would, I would say until a contract is signed, um, my concern is always in this political environment uh, that you never know what somebody might decide. Somebody might decide to pull the rug out from underneath you. So my assumption is that that is what will happen. But until the contract is actually signed, I use the word assume. But it's a strongest. <laughs> We, I mean, yeah. They want to. I mean, they, they definitely want to. It hasn't hit the paper yet, but yeah. it's a very strong it's, it's commitment. Any other questions or comments on <coughs> CIT facility? I right. just have, okay. Let me just have one thing real quickly. Sure. I know there's been some discussion about the name. One of the things in talking with providers, keeping as however it's named, um, access center as part of the name is considered to be very important by the providers um, and the reason is as you start looking at the whole medical field and healthcare field across the state and nation access center are two words that are being used universally for this kind of facility and um, so somehow, whether it's the Johnson County Access Center or whatever it is, the idea is that it is access to, to immediate uh, stabilization and, and some treatment, but more importantly, access to other services and those connections. Also, it's very important that the word crisis is not attached to the center. Um, this is not an emergency room. This is not the same as the crisis center. Um, so the people are very, concern that there is confusion. So I think as we try to determine what that name is, um, I think it's important from what I've been told that Access Center is part of the name and the word crisis is not part of the name. So just throw that out. Anything else on this topic? All right, I said you got it again with IOC transit routes and hours of operation. I think I'll jump in on this one again. My name is uh, Jeff Fruit. I'm the city manager for the uh, city of Iowa City, and I'll be uh, brief. Um, our council has discussed in our budget deliberations some consulting dollars to conduct a uh, hours of operation and routes analysis for uh, our transit system. It's something that we have not done in uh, probably a couple of decades. Let's take a good hard look at uh, how we're running our routes and uh, the hours in which we're operating. Um, we have not yet firmly nailed down a scope for that. That'll be something the council starts deliberating probably in uh, February. And uh, the point of putting it on this agenda was to make you all aware. Um, we are certainly open to any other agencies that want to join us uh, in this contract if there's a uh, shared scope um, for, uh, again, uh, any agency that wants to explore uh, transportation related. Issues. So, uh, the time frame that we'll be looking at is to define the scope in February, March, maybe in April a little bit. Uh, hopefully, get a consultant on board um, at the beginning of the fiscal year, in July, so that we can start to make progress on what we think will probably be a uh, twelve-month uh, study. Is that uh, like a needs needs analysis? Yeah, so typically on a study like this, they're going to dive deep into our existing ridership numbers. They'll do a lot of outreach, um, look at uh, employment numbers and, and um, where um, the needs are. So there'll be rider surveys, community surveys, things of that nature to uh, determine how best to serve the public going forward. Any other questions or comments for Jeff? 
I would just say from the perspective of Iowa City, we would love to have other municipalities want to get involved in this and be willing to put some money into it so that we could broaden the scope and really look at more of a regional um, type transportation or, and, and by that I don't mean that everybody gets rid of their bus systems, I know that's a real problem with the way the federal dollars come in, but at least a much better coordinated system across the region. So. Um, yeah. Well, if people are willing to, to do that, I think we can make it a much better project that would help a lot more people in Johnson County than if it's restricted to just Iowa City dollars and just Iowa City dreams. So we welcome your participation. So is the scope different than what the league did on the transportation study years ago, a few years ago? No, we did that from this committee or not. If you might mess up with something else. I believe, or the, uh, oh, that's the league one. No, did uh, you see again? Joint Council got to do a infrastructure <coughs> study. So leave with voters and somebody did it that maybe. Well, leave with voters has uh, done some surveys regarding uh, regional transit systems. Absolutely, okay. And, uh, but you know, um, the paratransit system by federal law has to match your uh, fixed route systems, both uh, in the footprint and in the hours of operation. So Johnson County running seats, we have a vested interest in this as well. So I'm not sure if we have money, but we're very interested in, so that's a conversation we'd love to have. Uh, I know I've been to a lot of meetings and actually on the board of a group called Community Transportation Committee. And uh, one of their issues is uh, providing workforce transportation to basically uh, the poor, the working poor. And we have uh, a lot of second and third shift workers and then a lot of people working on Sundays that uh, can't uh, adequately get to work without a car. So, uh, you know, extending operations, maybe time of day and maybe Sunday service would be something <coughs> and maybe we'd all have to uh, be on board for that, so. That's one of the things we'll certainly be looking at and people want. The, the issue, obviously, is the money in terms of expanding those hours. So we'll have to see what we can do. All right, next we've got University of Iowa, Iowa State Joint Declaration for Theme Semester. At our meeting last Tuesday, we as a council uh, proclaimed support and partnership with the University of Iowa for this year's theme semester. Uh, the theme fits well with our conversations and strategic plans about sustainability and environmental consciousness. Uh, since 2014, the university has had a pattern of theme semesters, and this semester's theme is uh, climate of change uh, with a focus on environmental sustainability. And each year, the theme semester has four goals. Uh, promoting attention to the theme as a crucial field of study across all of the university colleges, uh, building relationships among groups and individuals, engaging Iowans in a semester-long conversation, concentrating on the topic, and securing initiatives from the semester to benefit future generations. Uh, the proclamation was a joint declaration kicking off the University of Iowa Sustainability Theme Semester. And if you bear with me, I'll, I'll read that uh, declaration. It says, Iowa City and the University of Iowa jointly recognize that our efforts to inhabit and develop the university and the city must meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This requires that we must take actions that will simultaneously produce and sustain a healthy environment, ensure economic vitality, and enable that vitality to be shared equitably. Achieving this kind of sustainability requires knowledge about the relationship between humans and the natural world, especially about the effects of human actions on global and regional climates, and commitment to ensuring that costs, risks, and benefits of human action are shared equitably. We therefore jointly call upon students, faculty, and staff at the university, as well as the businesses and people of Iowa City and surrounding communities to commit their intellect, creativity, and practical skills toward considering how we, the university and the cities can ensure that our communities and university develop sustainably for all of us both now and in the future. In the spirit of this call, we jointly commit the university's theme semester to a local project that will tie together various elements along the Iowa River Corridor in Iowa City from Water Prairie Park in the north to Terry True Blood Park in the south. The, this project will acknowledge and celebrate the various historical factors that have shaped current human use along the river, respond creatively to challenges and opportunities in specific locations along the river, adapt to changes in the region's climate by making the areas adjacent to the river more resilient to future flooding, 
and use the river as a catalyst for future community and economic development that exemplify and fulfill the sustainability values and principles we don't jointly hold and regard. And the university has at least like 16 activities that are planned so far, including workshops and presentations. And the city's excited about uh, this partnership. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing and hearing more about this, uh, especially with some of the possible activities highlighting the river. So you can look forward to seeing those activities. Well, thank you, Pauline. Questions or comments for Iowa City on that? Sounds like a That's great. <clears throat> All right, next, uh, Corville, we have uh, Sherry who's going to talk a little bit about, uh, we have a new uh, cross course uh, that is uh, open and, uh, did I skip one? Oh, I, I, no pun intended there. That was that was All right, my bad. Sorry. Number three, I did some intended regional initiatives. Sorry, sure. I got too uh, too ahead of myself. But I was saying my bad. I think council that wanted it on isn't here, so I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Yeah, I think uh, this was Councilor Bachelet requested that this be on the agenda, and I think he was just open for a brainstorming session on topics that this board could could kind of. Uh, identify and, and maybe set for future meeting agendas but without him being here. I know our council didn't discuss any of his thoughts. Maybe we just move on to the park. Yeah. So I wasn't that far ahead of myself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. All right. I'm sorry sure proud. I do best serve as the director of parks and recreation for the city of Coralville. And um, we have some exciting things going on in the, in the area of trails, particularly off-road trails. So I wanted to share some of the things that we're doing. Um, we're looking at trails in a whole different way, of course, um, where all of our communities are building um, 10 foot, 12 foot, 8 foot wide concrete trails. And we in Coralville still are doing that and, and are continuing to add to our mileage. We're up to about 65 miles of um, either trails that are cut through woodlands and wetlands and follow our, our sewer and our storm sewer um, um, areas or um, over white sidewalks. But this past few years we've been working on taking people in, into some different areas that are really a lot of fun. We're going into the woods, um, through some ravines, over creeks, and just having a, a, a lot of fun doing this. This is a, our Parks and Recreation Commission um, out taking a look at one of the bridges that we were building in-house in and we're repurposing telephone poles. These are um, the wooden telephone poles that we're repurposing as well as um, we just took down all of the street light poles along highways. It's not all of them, but a, a section of them and replaced them. And uh, we have been repurposing them to build bridges as well. So just having, having uh, those become something that we can repurpose has been great. Um, I'm going to kind of go backwards in chronological order. Um, this past year we opened um, Creekside Cross. And if you're not familiar with a cycle cross, um, and if you've been to Jingle Cross, you know all about it. But you um, take a take a bicycle and you ride it, you run with it, you put it on your shoulder and, and jump things or jump with your bicycle. You do all kinds of, of really fun things over some neat terrain. Um, this idea to build a permanent a cycle cross course um, kind of came up last March when I was approached for somebody wanted to use our youth sports park for an event um, in November. And to me, it just didn't. It wasn't congruent with. Um, turf that we play ball on and we have soccer on and um, tearing that turf up for the purposes of a bike race. But as I got to thinking, um, and since I've known more about cyclocross and, and what they need for terrain, um, we started to think about other places and that's where we came up with this area. This is out by um, uh, the, our adult sports park on 340th Street in Corbel. So it's right up against 80 and 380 on the Southeast Interchange. And this area that you see all the yellow lines on is just an area of terraces, woodlands, um, some, some pretty good hills, and some creeks. So uh, we laid out a course with a group that has reformed into the Iowa City Cyclocross um, Club. They have that designation already and started using that again. Um, a lot of people from the Iowa Coalition of Off-Road Riders and from Goosetown Cycling make up this group. And so we have about, you can do anywhere from about 1.2 miles in a simplest course to we're up about um, over three, a three mile course if you want to configure it and go back and forth. So we've got um, sand, wet, 
hills, down hills, through ravines, over bridges, and if you pick up um, at the Charles Gay farm site, if you pick up um, going through the um, through the barns, which we did for one of the races, we've got that also um, as part of the course. Um, I'll just kind of go through some some pictures as I'm talking. Um, the, we started out in April um, doing some clearing with um, the swimmers, both men's and women's swim teams from the University of Iowa with Hawkeye Day of Caring. So this is one of the areas that um, they, they came out and cleared out all of the little brush, just real small stuff as we come down through one of our, um, into one of our ravine areas. And this is a shot just looking from a ball field up into what um, I just took this um, maybe middle of October. Um, into the hillsides and the different areas that we've been mowing out. We mow it twice a week. Um, roll it, that was a big part of getting it to flattened out and, and mowing and rolling to get a course that was um, not gonna chew up bike tires. And um, came out with, uh, with the opening day here in August. Last August we cut the ribbon. We had about 120 people come out and celebrate with us and many people on bicycles. So we, we um, not only took a walk, it's open for pedestrians, it's open for cross-country running, um, for biking, as well as um, snowshoeing and cross-country skiing. So that's why we call it Portal Cross, and we don't designate that specifically for cyclocross. Just a couple of photos from that day, um, gathering to talk about the space. Um, you can see just a lot of people are ready to ride, and this is one of our takeoff shots. Um, got just a variety of people that came out. Um, men, women, young, old, we've got riders from age six all the way to age 76 that are using the course and giving us feedback on it. Um, we, this is the third permanent cyclocross course in Iowa, and I love Nick Sobosinski. Um, I knew Nick Sobosinski when he was about this big, <laughs> and now he's, of course, the growing man with the child, and he, he says our course blows it, out, blows it out of the water, so he's very excited. I mean, it's really neat for us to have a portable resident who's been involved um, in this process and grew up here in Coralville. Um, it cost us only about $4,500 to put this together, and we did it mostly in-house with the help of um, volunteers. So between the volunteers from Iowa City Cyclocross Club, Hawkeye Day Appearing, and our own staff, um, put this together in five months and um, started riding in August. So we started out with the Tuesday, Thursday rides, um, trying to, to still break in the course, we had to, had to do some seating, so we wanted to protect it along, and by the third week of September, we were open for full-time riding. Um, day, our first race day was the beginning of November, and Goosetown Racing held their first race out here. Um, we had about 120 riders each day, and this is one of our takeoff areas that actually comes up through the ballpark um, over that bridge that you saw earlier. Um, this is the end result. And I love the barns. Um, I love the photos we got from the barns as well as just watching the riders um, coming through the barns and through the different um, curves that we have through here. And here's a shot of one of those. So um, we are open July, beginning of July to spring thaw. And then we reassess the course. We don't want anyone kind of the, the um, rule of thumb is if you can see your tire tracks behind us, behind you, you shouldn't be on the course. And so through spring, spring, spot, uh, spring thaw, it will um, settle out, we'll do additional seeding in May, and um, grow it in, and we're hoping to be open even a little bit before July 1, and get people starting to prep for Jingle Cross again then in September. So that's cycle, the Accord Little Cross, um, we're also partnering right now with Think Bicycles, just recently put in a Dero fix-it station out there. Um, our staff are building um, bike racks that are in particularly um, will fit cross bikes because they don't have kickstands and they're very lightweight and everything. So we <coughs> want to put those up in a different way. So they're uh, hand building those right now and we'll put them in. And uh, so we've got some picnic tables, kiosk, mapping, all of that stuff that we've done here this fall. So. Um, my staff have really enjoyed this project. Um, we get to do so many wonderful things with the city of Coralville, and uh, this was just something that they just ran with and really liked working with the community. It's very grassroots, um, and we just really enjoyed bringing this to Coralville. 
The second thing that we've been working on for several years now is wood, the Woodpecker Single Track Trail. Just named that this past summer. But we started with some rogue trails, and this isn't a very good picture because we, we mow on both sides of this. I think this is one of the first times they've been out on the trail. Um, but um, if you're not familiar with single track, very low impact, um, six to 12 inches wide. Um, again, if you can see your bike tires behind you, you should be riding on it. Um, and this goes through the, the creek, um, the Clear Creek wetlands in that area. If you're familiar with south of Highway 6, we have about, let's see if I've got, a, I've got a picture of the map here coming up, so I'll talk about that then. What I like about this particular type of trail is you can get people really, really close to things that you're not able to build close to um, when you're building 10 foot trail. So um, the Clear Creek is one of the kind of the neatest things about Coralville, and you really can't get very close to it unless you take a hike in the woods or a bike in the woods. So this is one of my favorite shots from um, getting right up beside the creek. Takes us through our wet meadows, our wetlands down in that area. This shows you where we're at, Camp Cardinal Boulevard there at the left of the screen, um, and all the way over to just south of Applebee's on the right side, some of the mapping there. Um, it's just about a three mile course as you loop back and forth through there. And the blue part is something that we um, put in this fall with the Iowa Coalition of Off-Road Riders, and they call that loop for the birds. Mm -hmm. And it is, yeah, and it is, um, it has quite a few rock features that you ride through through there. So it's a little bit harder and offers that challenge. This is mostly a green course. In the International um, Mountain Biking Association's rules, they call them green, blue, and black. And we're mostly green. We have a few features that would be considered blue. Um, this fall, we added signage, um, entry points. We're starting to bring those together a little bit better, put up mapping. Um, you park to use this um, at the Tom Harkin Trailhead on Camp Cardinal Boulevard and come in from the west end, or you can ride right down and come in from the east end just south of Applebee's. Um, there's a picture of some of the signage we put in uh, along here this fall. What I love about getting out on this course is that it, you, you don't know that you're in town. By the time you get into this woodlands, um, it's so quiet and so peaceful. Um, it, it really is a lot of fun. I have a hybrid bike, so I don't, I don't ride a mountain bike. Um, my husband says one bike's enough. And so um, he, uh, uh, this, but this is doable on a, on a hybrid bike if you've got one of those. Um, this is a, a picture of us working with i on an area where we needed to go through um, a little bit wetter area. So we wanted to, um, instead of plowing through there and making trails and having it closed most of the time, um, the staff researched and found a way to get across there with this board box system. And so it almost looks like cake pans turned upside down. And then you have these posts that is set into it. And if you notice on the boardwalk, it has a bracket. So these, these can be adjusted as the, the turf moves. So um, they can be adjusted. Um, if something gets out of a little bit, bit wonky, they can go out and adjust and make sure it's safe. It's a really neat feature. This is um, you know, more of a probably um, along the lines of pushing a blue feature. It's not that wide. But um, if I can ride it, I think a lot of people, people can ride it. And then there's, this is a loop that you can avoid, too. So we're just working on um, different areas that we can um, send people for different types of experiences. So it's really fun that we are working on now. Our next loop here, um, ooh, that's not very clear. Um, so Camp Cardinal Trailhead is on the top side, top right. And then we're putting in an additional two and a half miles of um, Woodpecker Single Track Trail, and um, all the volunteers have been working out that diligently this winter. We hope to have this. In fact, parts of it are open this spring, or already. Josh Schammer has already told me he's been out and rode the whole thing, loves it, wants to be, we, we told him we'd sign him up for the next work day, of course. Um, but we have some bridges that we built here with those telephone poles, and we'll use some additional um, uh, features with the, the um, boardwalk so we've got some areas of that to do and that will bring us up to about six miles and i believe that's the largest in the county as far as um, continuous in one area these are some features we hope to add in the next phase of both ends of this um, this is called uh, we've got the boardwalk but then you've got this skinny off to the side 
and again, <laughs> features that you can go one way or another. So you have a challenge for everyone using those. And um, these are some of the other things that you can just build. Uh, staff are just, they, they just have a lot of fun researching and coming up with some different ideas. Some of these we've been able to do with earthen berms. We actually have a double roller on the first um, section of the woodpecker trail. It's all, actually all made out of dirt. And the first time I wrote it, I was going a little bit fast. Um, so it was, boom. But it, it, since then, I've learned how to ride that one. So a lot of fun. Great way to interest people who maybe don't want to ride on that 10-foot trail. They've done that, been there, and they want something different. Really connecting. We are really connecting with the youth in our community right now through this. They love riding this, um, these kinds of trails. Um, the Boy Scouts are using it. Girl Scouts are using it. So um, watch for more things to do here with off-road riding in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. um, do the green, blue, and black features uh, refer to the difficulty level? Yes, mm. yeah, green is the easiest and black is the hardest. And, and yeah. you can see that as you go, I mean, are there <coughs> there's, signs? Yeah, there's little there? little icons, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll show you, kind of, just like mm. you're on a ski trail. Stay you know, off the it's, black line. Yeah, just stay <laughs> off the black <laughs> yeah. On pricing on this one, um, that 120 feet you saw of the boardwalk, um, that was about $9,000. Um, for us to do. So again, really low impact, um, budget friendly to do our off-roads. Um, so we're, we're just looking at different ways we can do that as, as right alongside building our, um, our concrete trails. You sure. Any questions, comments? Or, yeah, Mike. Um, one of the things we're working on uh, is trail connectivity. Yeah. So my question is on the Clear Creek Trail, mm -hmm. um, you end right now uh, around uh, Coral Ridge Mall area, just south, not far from, sure. from uh, Woodpecker. Yeah. Uh, and you guys are taking that out to 8380, mm -hmm. and uh, what's the time frame on that? So we end at Deer Creek Road <coughs> right now, and just, just to the east of there, we have an additional 1.2 miles to do. It was bid last Wednesday through the DOT, and, um, and that's on council agenda tomorrow night for acceptance of bid and they'll start rolling as soon as they can. Um, probably a 16 to 18 month building process on that one. We have seven underpasses under the I-80 and 380 um, interchanges and two bridges to build. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be an interesting project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right, any other business from near the entities? I just, uh, maybe a question for our next meeting, uh, if folks are up to it, I wonder if the school district folks would be willing to give us a little report on how the uh, uh, planning and construction and everything is coming from the bottom. Great. Any other new business from any of the entities? I thought this is a record fast joint meeting. <laughs> Oh, yes, sir, yes. My name is Bob Rush. I would remind you all of housing. Don't ever forget the need for affordable, accessible <coughs> housing for all persons. Uh, you know, I guess one of my goals would be that uh, every home built would be accessible. Uh, and on the affordability issue, what this is where we've got a long ways to go. Because it seems to me <coughs> people who work in our community should be able to afford to live in our community. And that's just not true. And uh, so I want to keep challenging you at that point. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, Mike. Along those lines, um, I, along with Bob, we're on the Johnson County Task Force on Aging. We're actually having a forum on Monday, February 12th, Coralville Public Library at 2 o'clock on just this topic. It's uh, the tentative title is Senior Housing Affordable and Accessible? Question mark. So uh, you're all invited to come to that. We'll have uh, Tracy Ackerbach will be one of the panelists, and we'll have 
four or five other panelists that can address uh, the issues of affordability and, uh, and accessibility, especially when it comes to senior housing. Great. Any other new business, or should we uh, figure out where and when we're meeting next? I'm not sure whose turn it is on the docket. I think we were in Iowa City before, weren't we? We were from Iowa City to here. Um, we were at the county. Oh, we were at the county, right. We were at the county, yeah. Probably going to Liberty School or Tiffin. Or Tiffin. <laughs> there we go. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> <laughs> so so this district, and that way you might have your facility or your. If we look at dates, three months from today, we'd be at. April, April 16th. Yeah, April 16th. Any objections on that? <laughs> All right, school district uh, on Dodge, April 16th. 4 30. Start at 4 and begin at 4 30. Perfect, yeah. So, Craig, yes, I provide a lot of good food. I was going to say, take a note on that. All right, well, I guess it will yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't end it there. <laughs> Thanks for coming and, and uh, let's wish it. Yeah. <laughs> You're on a tight ship. <laughs> <laughs>